This is Wisconsin Land and Water, and we're going to have a webinar today, and the title is Providing Habitat for the Wild and Rare, a Non-Game Wildlife Habitat Guide to Complement Stream Restoration Projects Incorporating Non-Game Habitat Features into Stream Restoration Projects. And our presenter today is Jeff Hastings, and now we'll go to Jeff. So this is the uh, Driftless uh, area that uh, that I, my project area is uh, for us in Wisconsin. It's the southwest part of Wisconsin. Um, probably one of the first, uh, one of the best guides for you to look at what possible ideas you might have for non-game habitat would be the uh, State Wildlife Action Plan. Uh, we utilized the State Wildlife Action Plan for southwest Wisconsin when we started looking at some of the different uh, amphibians and reptiles that we could possibly include into our, our stream restoration project. Uh, for us, it, it only makes sense. Uh, we've got uh, about 4,000 miles in the Driftless area, and since the Driftless area is made up of a high diversity of plants and animals, uh, it only made sense that we try to incorporate some habitat for these non-game species that are in this riparian corridor and actually in, in the stream. I can't talk about stream restoration in the Driftless area unless you have a little bit of a background on uh, what we're dealing with. Uh, these are some of the Coon Creek historic uh, watershed uh, photos, and uh, it shows some of the devastation that occurred back in the uh, early 1900s. And so what happened is these, uh, these hillsides and pastures and crop fields literally unraveled, uh, depositing uh, anywhere from 8 to 10 feet of sediment on our, our floor. That yellow line represents the uh, historic, uh, probably the uh, top of the uh, valley floor. And then that red line shows the accumulation of the sediment that occurred uh, probably in the late uh, 1920s, 1930s. Oh, that tall guy in the background there, that's uh, Joe Schmelt, uh, district conservationist now in, uh, in Grant County, um, started uh, uh, working with us in, in Vernon County. So here's a schematic uh, showing pre-settlement conditions. Uh, you can see our valley floors were, were, were uh, um, mostly a sedge metal, uh, our streams were deep and narrow, and life was good if you were a trout. Uh, but after post sediment, uh, we saw that cultural sediment was deposited, our, our streams became wide and shallow, and uh, we had quite a bit of warming that occurred. Um, uh, again, uh, just to give you a little background about our stream projects, uh, you know, typically we take out trees in, in our, our stream recording corridor, especially if they're shallow rooted trees like these box elders here. Uh, they don't hold the ground well, they tip over, they cause a lot of erosion, uh, they shade out the grasses, and so uh, we leave the uh, large cottonwoods and, and the big hardwoods but take out the uh, shallow rooted trees. And so managed raising uh, kind of gives you, a, if you look in the lower right there, it kind of looks kind of a you know, pre-settlement, kind of like uh, open conditions, uh, narrow, deep, uh, streams. So if the livestock are managed well, for our cold water streams, they uh, they work quite well in our scenario. Uh, in fact, they help us maintain our practices uh, long after we, we've completed them. So this is just a, a picture kind of pre-construction. Uh, uh, we've already gone through here and, and removed the uh, the uh, shallow rooted trees. Uh, the next thing will be is to come back and slope the banks. Um, and then incorporate habitat uh, for some trout. Uh, historically, we've done this with this uh, a lunker structure that's placed underneath this large cover rock, uh, placing this habitat. Uh, overhead cover is one of the limiting factors we find for fish. Um, but we wanted to look at other things that we could do for other species that lived in that riparian corridor. Uh, this is a, a more detail than probably you, you would want to study here, but it just uh, the, the chart just kind of gives you an idea that uh, just by placing in the overhead cover for uh, trout, we can increase the carrying capacity of that stream almost tenfold. So in this case, uh, where we had probably eight, eight or ten fish per mile, now we're looking at over several hundred fish per mile. Um, and the same idea is with the non-game species. You know, what can we do to in that narrow carrying corridor that can increase the carrying capacity of those non-game species? What's, what's the limiting factor? We've known for years, uh, uh, when we've gone into a stream restoration project, 
that uh, when we when we take out a, a drift like this the tree that is loaded in there, that uh, we are going to remove some habitat for a number of different species. Uh, uh, surprisingly, uh, actually, uh, turtles. We've got a number of species of tur turtles that overwinter in these sediment-laden areas below these drifts. Snakes will use these areas, birds. But uh, this habitat is only temporary. Uh, it, it's here now, but in the next flooding event, it could be very well gone. And where it is right now, it's causing a lot of erosion. So the idea was, how can we take out this temporary habitat and replace it with permanent habitat that will benefit these non-game species? So what we did is we developed what we call the Wild American Committee. And you could do the same thing in your area uh, by, by bringing the uh, local herpetologist and, and your specialist in, uh, the guy in the uh, uh, mob or purple shirt here is Bob Hay. He was a former state herpetologist for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. This is Armin Bartz. He's our Department of Natural Resources uh, non-game specialist. Uh, and uh, and then we and this is uh, Mike Leonard with our DNR fish habitat crew. So the idea was to get together the folks that are doing the conservation work with the herpetologist. And, and get an exchange going back and forth to see what additional habitat we can include into our project. This happens to be our, our second uh, so-called kick at the cat here. This is our second non-game wildlife habitat guide. Um, well, I would say it's kind of a working document. Uh, uh, we did our first one, and then five years later we did this one. And so maybe another five years from now we'll come back and we'll add some additional conservation practices and uh, improve it uh, more and maybe tweak some of the designs if we find that they're not working like we, like we thought they would. Um, but uh, again, I would like to you know, just state that you know, since we've included a lot of the non-game habitat uh, practices and, and species into our projects, we've brought on new partners that we've never really worked with before. Uh, you know, like the Nature Conservancy may have been interested in the stream restoration project in the past. But you know, bank stabilization and fish habitat is nice. But when we started making it more encompassing, holistic, uh, incorporating these non-game species, all of a sudden you've got uh, new partners and, and new funding sources that you uh, that you haven't worked with. Let's give you a little bit of a brief overview of the uh, habitat guide, and uh, this is available online. So if you ever want to download a, a sections of it or get, get an idea on how we put this together, uh, I'll have that at the end of the uh, webinar. So we just did a basic uh, introductory. Uh, this is more information for someone that uh, was just starting to get into this and talking about uh, you know, the dripless area and again where they could find additional information about some of the non-game species. Oops, sorry, wrong way. Uh, and then we broke it down into the different uh, uh, birds and vertebrates and mammals and, and so forth, uh, trying to give a little bit more detail, uh, history background on the, on the different species that we find in the driftless area every day. Uh, and then we broke it into a riparian area, uh, our, our stream banks, and then in stream, um, talking about the different, different practices. Uh, this happens to be uh, one of our, the, the non-game habitat practices that uh, that we've utilized on a number of our projects. Uh, it's a snake hibernaculum, uh, not not for uh, poisonous snakes, but for uh, milk snakes, fox snakes, and, and garter snakes. And one of the key thing about our, our practices are we try to use uh, materials that we have on hand. Uh, I think. The uh, fabric here, the geofabric here, is probably you know something that typically we would have in our project, but uh, uh, the rock, the, using the excavator, uh, those kind of things uh, make it very cost effective. Uh, we're down here doing our stream restoration. We've got large equipment and rock. We can put in a snake hibernacula. Uh, hibernacula stands for overwintering habitat. We can put in one of these snake hibernaculas for about a thousand dollars. Yes. If a landowner wanted to put in a hibernacula and had to bring in an excavator and dump trucks and, and, and do all this, it would probably cost them two to three times as much. Uh, but once you've done one of these, you can do it in, in about uh, an hour or, or less. Um, this is a schematic of a side, side view. Uh, I didn't realize this, but fox snakes, milk snakes, and garter snakes spend uh, the winters with over 95% of their body underwater. So 
on the upper right here, you see the chimney. This is the entrance where the snake enters the hibernate macula, goes down into this saturated water zone, and, and places its body in the water over winter for for uh, for the winter. And then there's a, a little bit of a escape here in case it gets a high water event. And then it's covered with five feet of sediment as an insulating factor. I asked Bob Hay, the herpetologist, one time. I said, "So, how many snakes could use a hibernacula like this?" And he said, "It would not be uncommon to see as many as 800 garter snakes uh, uh, use a hibernacula." Uh, we're in the uh, uh, Winona uh, University right now, looking at uh, monitoring this chimney here, trying to decide using monitoring uh, uh, like game trail cameras to to uh, uh, See how much use these these hibernaculas are, are going are being used. Uh, one of the things that uh, we did to uh, tap into additional funding sources was to put all of our non-game habitat practices into a standard uh, uh, NRCS design. Uh, Joe Schwelt uh, did these for us. Uh, then I took them to the Wildlife Committee and, and the State Engineer. And now we've got uh, these practices are funded as part of NRCS's uh, uh, tech guidebook, uh, and we use farm bill dollars to help offset costs. We even tried to incorporate one of these hibernaculas into a, a stream stabilization project, just much like we do our lunker structures. Um, typically, they are placed off the bank, uh, but we thought, you know, why not incorporate it? You got the saturated water zone here, sloping it. And then the uh, chimney would be on the back side of the uh, bank. Uh, the tubes just happened to be uh, in this project because we are monitoring the temperature of the water, uh, both in stream uh, hibernacula and then the one that was off stream uh, using uh, tidbits. Uh, so some of the in stream uh, habitat practices, again, I said we've, we've broken this down into uh, in, -stream, in stream habitat features and then uh, riparian. Uh, some of our uh, riparian uh, projects, I would say, when we first started, uh, looked pretty artificial. Uh, you know, this is a uh, this is a, a scrape with uh, some woody material added, and I think you know it, it looks it looks pretty artificial. Um, so for those of you that know, this is this is Kelly Jacobs over here looking the, looking the wrong way into the camera here, but uh, um, uh, but as as time kind of lends itself. To, and as, as uh, technicians got more and more used to seeking opportunities, uh, they look more natural. Uh, here's a, a shallow wetland uh, uh, area off to the side of the stream. Uh, historically, we would have we would have probably filled this in right across here, and, and filled this uh, this little area in, thinking that it was going to be just. Oh, I thought... Some background right quickly. Okay. But uh, historically, we probably would have filled that area in, thinking it was going to be detriment to the stream temperatures. Uh, but uh, we um, have found that uh, that these are very, very have very little effect on our overall temperature of that stream. Uh, and what we do find is that these areas are slightly warmer, and so the trout don't enter these areas. So it provides a refuge area or a nursery for our forage uh, fish. And of course, amphibians just just love these these areas. Uh, the non-game habitat guide over in the driftless area is, is met with a lot of wide acceptance. Uh, our fish habitat crews, our, our county and federal employees in the field offices have uh, incorporated a lot of non-game habitat practices into their projects. Uh, this is a recently completed project from the Department of Natural Resources fish habitat crew out of La Crosse. Uh, maybe I'll just take a stop and just breathe a little bit here. <laughs> And if anybody has any questions, I'll be more than glad to answer them. And again, you can just unmute yourself if I've muted you, if you muted yourself, or you can send in a chat at any time to ask Jeff questions. Either of those are totally fine to do. Okay, I'll, I'll continue on. And like I said, uh, I'll try to provide some opportunity for you to add any questions if you, if you want to. So this is one of our first, uh, I, like I said, this habitat guide is something that I always think is always going to work some progress. 
This is one of the first tur turtle hibernaculas. Again, tur hibernacula stands for overwintering. And Bob Hay, the state herpetologist, came up with this uh, design. Uh, you can see the stream flows this way. Here's our habitat structures for fish. And his idea was to put this turtle hibernacula on the inside bend where the sediment would build up. Uh, surprisingly, uh, we've got several species of turtle turtles in the driftless area that spend uh, as much as three months of the year underwater. Now, a turtle is an uh, amphibian, but they're able to trap oxygen and burrow themselves into the sediment uh, for as much as three months out of the year. Now, we saw this uh, design and, and, and understood the placement, but we said to Bob, you know, what if it wasn't rock? A big flat rock like this can be expensive, take a, quite a bit of time to install. What about using uh, wood? We use wood uh, when we do our, our uh, field day, our, our workshops, our chapters. And once this wood is placed under underwater, it's virtually uh, uh, rot resistant. So we came up with this uh, wood design. Many recognize Tony Pillow up here in the upper left. Uh, we came up with this uh, wood design, uh, and again, Joe uh, put it out into a NRCS standard format design in here so that we could uh, uh, seek NRCS uh, funds. Uh, this is a Again, uh, I'm calling a very cost-effective, uh, you know, it, we built the structure during one of our lunker building days, probably for about $150. The excavator was there on hand, a couple of slots with an excavator, and we were able to uh, put that lunker structure, in, or that uh, turtle structure in for very limited dollars. One of the things we, uh, we, we realized early on that uh, wood floats, and so we had to add this uh, large rock uh, into our design so that we could get it to, to sink below the water level. Uh, this is a, a great practice and a, a perfect example of how we can uh, think outside the box and, and it's not only cost effective but uh, it also provides a lot of non-game benefits. So in the upper right you see these uh, large what we call refuge areas. Um, historically again we would have pinched this stream up, narrowed this stream up and, and filled this backwater area in, but by using these uh, uh, like kickers or, or um, like, kind of like a J-hook, a downward facing J-hook, uh, we were able to not only create some habitat for non-game species, but we were able to make this uh, practice uh, uh, cost effective and, our, and also make our overall stream restoration uh, project more cost effective. Uh, the same thing in the lower right, you can see, uh, and again, this is, uh, both of these are Joe Schmeltz's uh, projects. Uh, we had to, we used trees when we take them out of the repairing corridor, and he used the trees to bounce the water back and forth. Uh, these rip logs will, will help uh, deepen this, this channel and also provide some uh, non-game habitat at the same time. Uh, this is a, a section that we added into our, our second edition of our non-game ha habitat guide. Uh, we were seeing some uh, practices go uh, in where they weren't probably appropriate. So uh, this is an example of, of where and what, when it's appropriate to put in uh, a turtle hibernacula. Uh, our cold headwater streams are really void of any turtles, and to put a, a turtle hibernacula into such a place would, would really be a, a waste of time and, and money. So uh, we provided, provided these uh, schematics, uh, not schematics, but these uh, uh, charts uh, on some of the various practices and when and where it was appropriate. Uh, this makes me think of also uh, one, one of the things that we've done is, is, is done an evaluation. I uh, walked over some of these projects and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but when we first put in a turtle hibernacula, we were putting only in one per project. And so if, if you only uh, put in one area for overwintering into a, a large area, and all the turtles would gather into that, that area. Uh, if there was a disease outbreak, it could, cover, it could uh, transfer to all the turtles in that area. So one of the things that we've tried to do is try to help determine, you know, should we put one turtle hibernacula or two turtle hibernacula into the area? And these are things that we are constantly uh, trying to um, re revitalize our, our habitat guidebooks with. Monitoring is a big part uh, of our, our projects. Uh, we encourage uh, folks that are doing uh, non-game habitat to try to do some monitoring of the practices that they've installed. Uh, currently, we're working with UW-Platteville and Winona State 
uh, students to monitor some of our, our non-game habitat uh, projects. This to evaluate, are they, are they being used, are they not being used, why are they not being used, uh, um, and, and, and then if we need to make some tweaks to them, uh, we, we can. I've gone over a couple of, of the practices, but you can see that we've got a whole list of uh, different practices that we've uh, put onto NRCS standards for our non-game habitat guide. Um, and we hope to uh, include additional practices as, as time goes on. Uh, uh, as more and more technicians and, and like our fish and wildlife uh, habitat crew out of the cross do these projects, I think they're going to come up with more and more new designs for us to add to the book. I mentioned my evaluation. I think that's very important. Uh, if you've got funders or partners, I think uh, not only before but after we, you walk to the project site and, and, and see what they like, what they don't like. Uh, this is a learning process. Uh, and it, uh, you're only going to get better the more of these you do. So um, with our stream restoration project, it's all di about diversity. Uh, the more diversity you have in the project, the more you can attract a wide variety of, of species. Training, you'll probably recognize the uh, Vernon County Land and Water Conservation Department staff here. Uh, uh, we find it uh, important to uh, train uh, once we come out with some new uh, habitat uh, designs. Uh, we've had some field days. We typically use our Department of Natural Resource Fish Habitat crews to uh, show local conservationists, uh, even our team chapter members, to come out in the field and see how some of these practices are, are being installed. Um, the same goes with contractors. Uh, uh, most contractors know how to dig a basement, know how much time it's going to take to put in the basement, but uh, for them to put in a fish habitat structure or some of these non-game habitat structures, uh, they're, they're going to need to know how to bid on it. And so we've had a number of contractor workshops also. I've got just a few more uh, uh, slides and a few more practices that we've just um, developed in the last couple of years. Uh, this happened to be about a 12, 14 foot eroding bank over in Minnesota. And as you can see, there was a number of bank swallows that had burled into this, this layer. And, uh, this was, a, this was the uh, fall before, and when I came down in the spring that we were going to do the project, I decided that I was going to uh, put netting over this so that uh, we wouldn't have all these bank swallows in, at the time of construction. But what happened is that the, uh, that the bank had totally collapsed. So something that I thought we'd never have to provide uh, eroding banks for bank swallows and built kingfishers uh, held true with a lot of our practices. They're only temporary. They're in an area where flooding can, can drastically change uh, the practice. So the idea was how can we come up with some stable uh, vertical banks for both the kingfishers and, and swallows. And so we came up with this artificial design. Uh, we've always got a lot of sediment. When we slope these banks back, uh, we have literally tons and tons of sediment that we typically take out of the floodplain. Uh, but this, in this opportunity, we were able to compact it and create this vertical uh, wall here uh, for nesting bank swallows and velvet kingfishers. This is the schematic that we finally came up with then to, uh, for this practice. Uh, one of the things that we learned from uh, this previous one is that probably should have put a lens in here of softer building material for the uh, swallows and velvet kingfishers. If you look at most typical banks where you see the Delta Kingfishers, like in the lower right here, there's an area there where the material is of, of proper construction so that they can make these holes. So uh, sandy loam possibly would, would probably be great to add into that, into that vertical bank as an area for them to burrow into. Uh, and again, this is a, a lacrosse in our fish habitat crew, recent project on, on timber coulee. Um, historically, when they bench, this is when they bench this project on the lower left here, they would have sloped this back bench or this back wall and blended it into the front. Uh, but because they saw the opportunity of a vertical bank here uh, for both the kingfishers and swallows, they, they left it as a, a, as a vertical bank. And I think that's it, uh, Penny. I, I'll be glad to answer any questions. As I, you know, in the lower right here, you'll see uh, our site where you can pull up a PDF of the uh, non-game habitat guide. 
Uh, and we're hoping probably in another two, maybe three years to get the team together and uh, look at the practices that have been installed over the last five years uh, and, and see if we need to make any changes and see if we can add some new practices. So I would encourage you as you do your conservation work to uh, look at, uh, think outside the box, think about your seeding mixtures, uh, possibly some of the non-game habitat practices you could install uh, in adjacent to your your, your projects. Uh, you'll find that this will bring in new funding, new partners, and give you a better project. So if there are any questions, I'd be glad to uh, answer them at this time. Any questions, anyone? That was great, Jeff. Um, I, I learned some things too and appreciate you volunteering. Actually, anyone can volunteer to do a webinar if you want to or if there's a need for some kind of presentation, webinar, or training. You can always let us know here at Wisconsin Land and Water. Um, we put these on through the State Interagency Training Committee. And we're always looking for new trainings. So um, if there's no questions, I think we're going to sign off. And thanks again, Jeff. And everyone have a great day. Thank you.